Um, if it's okay with everybody, can you hear me in the back? I don't like podiums. I'm, I'm a little bit of a wanderer. Is that, and that's probably going to mess you up a little bit, but I'll try to. I'll try to stay in an area here. No, it's a privilege to, to come speak to the organization. I was here a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm told my sins were forgiven, so now I'm back. Um, both of them. Most of them, yeah. Uh, I had started talking to Ken a while back, and I you know, kind of begged him to come, and Ken kept saying, no, Doug, you're not ready. And uh, I, I'd call back, and he'd say, no, I'm still not ready, and he'd call back, and no. Finally, I said, Ken, I'll speak for free, and he said, well, now you're ready. <laughs> so, uh, so it's an honor to be here. Tonight, the topic I'm bringing you, I call it change management, why most companies don't get it. So I'm going to open with a little bit of a poll. How many of you have been part of a change management initiative at your employer that kind of went, didn't work too well? Okay, pretty good. I'm going to call it half of the room at least has had a little bit of that experience. <coughs> so uh, what I'm going to do is uh, kind of blow through this pretty, pretty quick. What we're going to do is talk a little bit about change management practices. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, I do want to talk about the significance of the difference between management and leadership because I believe that's a, a key factor. And uh, we will talk a lot about why change fails and also how to maximize the opportunity. But uh, first I want to share a story with you of some of my own experience with major change management. Back in 1992, we called it process improvement. And I worked for a large regional bank. Some of you, I see the gray hair in the room, you might remember a bank called Texas Commerce. It was here in Houston. We were, we were quite the organization at the time. We were setting records for earnings growth. We were sort of the gold standard for how to run and operate a bank. We um, had a number of milestones and markers of, of proficiency. And nonetheless, our senior leadership decided we needed to improve our process in 1992. And here's some of the backstory on why they chose to do that. We had just come out of a branch banking conversion. Again, some of you may not be old enough to remember this, but once upon a time, you could not go to just any bank and do your banking business. You had to go to a very specific location to get your banking done because a building across the town uh, could not take your deposit if your account was downtown. And um, through a lot of regulatory change, we created branch banking here in the state of Texas, and we added interstate banking. You couldn't go out of state and cash a check very well. And we added that, and so we were in a major upheaval as an industry. We were going through a lot of things, but we as an organization, we had 71 member banks, is what we called them before branching, around the state. We didn't have a bank on every corner. We had a unit bank. Here in Houston, we had about 16 locations, but they operated pretty much as independent banks. Just because they had our flag on it, it was hard to do banking all over the city with our organization. We had just come through all that. Again, our leadership decided to give us, to run us through process improvement. <laughs> So here were our goals and objectives. We wanted to find some cost savings. We had grown up, we were a big organization. We had, as I recall, about 6,000 employees statewide. That's not a huge number by some standards, but it was big for us. Um, we knew that we were at about the 25 year mark as in, the, in terms of the age of the organization so we knew in our gut, we had created some sacred cows. Everybody know what I mean by sacred cow? We had policies and procedures that were in play. And when you ask, why do we do that? The answer was, we've always done it that way, right? We, businesses everywhere run into that, we had it. And we wanted to uh, deal with those. We, one of the big rules of the road for our process improvement initiative was that there are no sacred cows. 
okay? So how did, we, how did we work through that? How did we get past that obstacle? Well, here's the structure and approach we used. If you were a VP and above at the bank at that time, you were given a new role. Now, you didn't leave your day job. You kept your day job, but you had another eight hours a day to put in for process improvement until we were done. And the goal was this. We were going to take this cadre of officers of the bank. I was lucky to be one. Uh -huh. um, and we were deployed into departments diametrically opposite us and in, in the bank, arguably a department we didn't know anything about. We just knew they existed, but we didn't know how they operated. We didn't know what their rules and regs were. We were white pages going in, okay? And we did this swap all over the organization and we began the project. Uh, and at our organization, there were about 16 separate lines of business or silos, as a lot of us call it, that we had to analyze and dive into. So we had 16 work teams going out, doing deep dives, digging into the organization, the policies, the procedures, the systems, all of that. I mean, nothing was sacred. Right. So the fun began. And the way we operated this, if you're going into a new unit, I was in real estate loan administration. I was assigned to our trust department to go in. I didn't know a whole lot about trusts, but um, I had to do my work in the trust department from eight to five because that's where the workforce was that I needed to be interviewing and working with and letting them show me what they did, why they did it, go through all of that. And then I usually would go back to my office about 5 or 5.30 and check on what my, my day job unit had been doing that day. You know, were there any problems? Were there any brush fires? So you can imagine the hours were long. And we did this project for about 14 months. It took us to go through the, the whole deep dive analysis, present our recommendations, get approvals, implement some things. Did it work? Well, here are the results. Yes, we identified $52 million of annual expense savings. Now, I know in some industries that doesn't sound like a big number. They, they use that as a rounding error. But for us, it was a big deal. It was a big deal at the time. And if you know the banking climate at that time, the model was shifting. We didn't make all our money on loans anymore. Margins on loans had shrunk very low, probably down to almost a third of what they had once been. So we were scrambling for expense savings and fee income to keep our profitability up. And uh, finding $52 million that was sustainable and repeatable, it wasn't just a one-time bogey. It was repeatable, so that was a big win for us. Um, we completed the reorganization, total reorganization, top-down restructure of eight of those 16 silos. So think about that for change in an organization. And by the way, my old unit that I had left to come from <laughs> got blown up. So I had a new job after it was all over. I still had a job. That was the good news. <laughs> We did have hundreds of policy and procedure changes that had now had to be redocumented, systems had to be recoded, those kind of changes had to be implemented, so we weren't even really finished with all that implementation after the 14 months. But we spawned all these projects to, to go get that done. Ah, and the last one, within 18 months, 30% of our management team left. Burned out. Sad outcome. Lost a lot of good friends in that war. But uh, fortunately, they've gone on to do greater things. And they're a great referral source for me today. So I'm happy they left and went on to find other things to do. Really kind of grew my opportunities. So let's talk about change management practices in general. I just want to kind of level set here and give you, get us all sort of on the same page. When we talk about change management, at least my experience tells me Typically, we go in and we create some definition or the scope of the change we want to make, right? It's kind of the first step. You take a look at whatever it may be. It may be caused by regulation or market shift, acquisition, 
uh, whatever, a lot of reasons you've got a need for a change, so you go in and define what that scope looks like. You begin your planning. You start working through your planning step, deciding what all am I going to have to do during this. And that is uh, typically most disciplines I'm familiar with. We identify stakeholders. We do impact assessments. We try to decide what departments, what function, what activity is going to be impacted. Do some gap analysis. And by the way, this may not be in the same order you're familiar with, but I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, the gap analysis is kind of the, let's talk about where we are today, the so-called as-is current state. Let's talk in, in our definition, maybe we're able to define the to be. What do we want to go to when we make this change? And with that in play, then you've got a gap. You've got a, some gap analysis to do to get you past that. Then you've got to start working on the buy-in. And you've got to create your execution. You have to go implement all this fine work and planning and change. And then you wash, rinse, and repeat. Everybody agree? Kind of the general gist of it. I know that's about 30,000 feet of change management, but that's the general gist of what the backdrop we're up against. So here's my experience. Buy-in always involves the people on the team. And you're dealing with, you know, if you're the manager of this change effort, how will the people <coughs> react? You're going to have early adopters, and you're going to have holdouts. You're going to have difficulty getting these people. And the worst is the subtle rebels. They'll come to your meeting, and they'll smile, and they'll take notes, and they'll ask good questions, and then they'll go, God, I don't want to do this, you know, when they walk out of the meeting, right? So this is a little bit of psychology now. This was written by a, a lady named Virginia Satir. And it's actually a psychology model used in that realm of discipline uh, for psychologists to help individuals with life change and aspects of change. But as I studied this, I thought, how appropriate. And I actually recall seeing this model or something very similar to it when we were being coached about process improvement in 1992, we were actually given some coaching to get our awareness as managers up about the problems we were going to have making this change happen. So stage one, you've got the old status quo. Stage two, you've got the recognition of a change you want to have happen, right? In stage three, you've got the initial pushback, the initial resistance. Why am I doing that? If you get past that, you don't, your curve doesn't go up. You actually go into this chaos zone. And in the words of the great and now deceased Heath Ledger in Dark Knight, you've got chaos. <laughs> and I, I love that scene from that movie with him describing his intent for the world. His vision of the world was chaos. We're going to get out of that, and we're going to move on to the integration phase where we actually start making some progress. We start dissimilating, sharing our visions, making our changes uh, begin to happen, and eventually you create the new status quo. You're actually operating on a higher plane, your change is implemented, and you're ready to go. Now, we don't have time tonight to dig into all of these stages, but I hope everybody can agree that, that this is a, a very appropriate. And again, keep in mind, this comes out of the psychology world, which, by the way, I'm not a licensed psychologist. I've never played one on TV, and I don't do that kind of work with my clients. But a lot of what I do in my coaching and consulting work borders right perilously close up to it. Um, but this is a good model to set our, our mind frame to understand that people we're dealing with are going through this kind of cycle in some form or fashion. Okay. So that brings me to my next point. The way to overcome this, in my humble opinion, is to talk about management and leadership. And the traditional approach to change management does leverage pure management to deliver. And 
I, there's a very simple definition of the distinction between these two that I'll share with you tonight, again, for sake of time. Management is about process, but leadership is about people. Now you say, oh, Doug, nay, nay, I'm a manager, I've got people on my team. Yes, but if all you're doing is managing them, what you're going to be doing is you're going to be pushing the buttons, pushing the schedules, making things happen, and getting them going. And yes, a quote, good manager can do that for some period of time. Your operating unit can function. I'm not disparaging that. You can function, but the reality is, in, in today's world where we're, as employers, we're so worried about employee retention, employee engagement, all those elements. I just left the HR Houston Symposium, their annual conference they had, it was last week down at NRG. Big buzzword, retention and engagement. Every other, there were about 75 different breakout sessions and about half of those sessions had to do with retention and engagement. Well, my argument here is if you perpetuate just the management mindset and that's all you subject your people to, you're gonna get some stuff produced, but you're gonna burn them out. Their loyalty is gonna wane over time and you're gonna be dealing with retention and engagement issues and you're gonna be operating a revolving door on your building. And leadership, on the other hand, will do the management stuff, but it will address the people issues. It will engage the people at a much deeper level, a higher level, a more uh, committed level. So you will be able to overcome, back to my chaos and the resistance curve and all that, you'll be able to deal with people more on that level to get them through this change. So I love this quote, a good leader will see more than the people around them and they will see it before the people around them. Think about that a minute. And this quote comes from a gentleman named John Maxwell who I've got the privilege of counting as my own mentor now. And uh, he just kind of came up with this uh, quote a couple of months ago and what he cited to us he said he has studied leadership now for about 30 years and what he and he's traveled the world by the way equipping leaders of all cultures all nationalities he said what he's found unique is that regardless of culture regardless of age regardless of gender leaders everywhere exhibit these two things they see things before the people around them and they see more than the people around them. So think about that. Think about the last great leader you think you've worked for. Maybe you've got the privilege of working for one now. I don't know. Sadly, I think they're rare in the marketplace today. But this is a, this is a great idea to think about the essence of leadership. And the blue pencil slide here. No? Guess not. Uh, driving change only occurs in one of two ways. So think a minute about your experience with change management. I'm going to tell you, real change only happens one of two ways. You can give me every example you've got in this room, and I'll, I'll show you one of these buckets that will fit in. One is by the stroke of a pen. Anybody heard of executive orders lately? <laughs> um, That's not going there. Yeah, I know. I know. I'll have to stop them. <laughs> pull up, Doug. Pull up, Doug. Um, but in business, stroke of a pen is a simple policy change. It can be about budget. It can be a lot of things. But uh, the other alternative is with behavioral change. Getting the people to adapt to what you're doing, where you want to go, how you want to do it. One of two buckets. Every kind of change you're going to deal with falls out in one of these areas, one way or the other. So I've got some examples here. The stroke of a pen, um, ordering by authority, just the power of your position, whatever that may be, you write the policy, boom, it is so. Money and budget can dictate that. Um, 
you still may have to do some planning and get some buy-in to do it, but nonetheless, it's pretty much done by the stroke of the pen. And you, you just know you're gonna make it happen. You're the manager, it's gonna happen. Behavioral change, on the other hand, requires getting the people, and perhaps a lot of them, to buy in and participate with you. Um, sometimes even the stroke of a pen requires people to adopt. So there may be a tipping point there where what you thought was going to be a simple stroke of the pen turns into the need for behavioral change. Uh, this is a slide I was looking for. Uh, Edwards, w. Edwards Deming was quoted as saying this, anytime a majority of the people operate in a particular way the majority of the time, the people are not your problem. Think about that a minute. We like to, as managers, we like to blame the people that work for us for a lot of things. Especially when it comes to change management, we think we can bulldoze the change, but we find out, well, the majority of the people are operating the same way a majority of the time. They have a reason for pushing back. So are the people really the problem or is it something inherent about the change that needs to be considered? Good observation from Deming. So, I got 10 solutions, and we will get out of here before nine o'clock, just kidding, just kidding. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna run through these pretty fast. Number one, I would argue we need to start our change management with compassion. Just because it's a great business idea, we have to realize and recognize change is scary for people. The unknown is very terrifying to most people. Um, you need to meet the people where they are, and you need to realize that their reactions are not necessarily personal, meaning they're not pointed at you if you're the leader of the change. They are simply reacting. They are going through the satir curve of change adoption, and you gotta figure out where they are on that curve and demonstrate a little bit of compassion about it. So how do you overcome it? You connect first. And I say, you've got to be able to think lead, not manage. If, if there's ever a time to be a leader, not just a manager, it's during change management initiative. You need to be able to get out there as a leader, inspire your team, engage your team, bring them along. Um, you want results, but you have to avoid the get over it mindset. I've heard that in the workplace many times. I've heard, I've had bosses. We go in, boss, this isn't gonna work. Here's our reasons, da 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 da. And the boss says what? Get over it, go fix it. Go make it work. Somewhere that can be applicable, but likely most of the time it's not. And this is something I see a lot in, in when I do my coaching with executives. I'm amazed at how many people have risen to pretty high levels in organizations and even among their direct reports, they don't know who those people are. They've allowed the position they're in to somehow shield them from getting to know anything about the people that are working for them. I've never understood how that can work. And I'm not talking about being friends and drinking buddies but I'm talking about engaging them at the, you know, on a work basis, but finding out you know, who they are. Number three, we need to figure out how to influence the influencers. This is one I love. In any organization that I've ever seen, read, or heard about, there's the formal organization chart, and then there's always a very robust informal organization chart. Everybody know what I mean? There's somebody in the trenches that has clout. They may not have the title, they may not have the position, but they're charismatic, they're committed, they're dogmatic, they got a personality, and they're gonna pull everybody else along with them. If you don't know who those people are on your work team, you better figure it out. And you better engage them because they are the influencers. They can help 
fast track your buy-in on your project. If you can figure out who these people are on your team. Pay attention to the group dynamics. Understand how these guys play. Identify those informal leaders. That's what I was just saying. And um, spend your energy working with these people first. If, you, if you're in a position and you're leading a change management effort and you've got the opportunity, you now have the uh, opportunity to start sharing the plan, creating the buy-in, these are the first people you need to call in to talk about it. And I wouldn't even do a team-wide meeting to make an announcement. I would start with these guys. Now, you may follow the team-wide meeting the hour after you dismiss these guys after your meeting, but it's worth having them there first. Then number four, you've got to hit resistance. You are going to have it. It's part of the satire curve we went over. There's a resistance segment in there. You will have it. You can't be the ostrich in the sand. It's going to happen. Um, draw it out in the open. There's nothing like an enemy you get in the wide open spaces. Ask any military guy. When they're hiding, they're hard to hit, but when they're out in the open, you can blow them away every time. Um, understand what the resistance may be, and as Stephen Covey taught us, seek first to understand, figure out who those guys are, or what these issues are. Then, deal with it. You can't be the ostrich in the sand, I'll repeat that. You have to be able to deal with it. And number five, communication, communication, communication. You've probably been to a seminar where you were taught about business communication. It doesn't go away. We have to be able to do this, especially in times of change management. If you even feel like you're over communicating, you're probably still not doing it enough when you're going through radical change. Be sure that the vision that has been mapped out is clearly understood by everybody being affected by the change. Um, be steady and positive about it. When we were going through our change management exercise at the bank, we had already had a tradition of a Friday morning officer meeting. Every officer in the bank gathered up. We had a big auditorium downtown right on uh, Main Street. Everybody would go over there at 8 o'clock. We would, we would gather in this large auditorium, and we would hear from senior management. And you know, before process improvement, we talked about market conditions and regulatory change and things that were happening at large. But once a week, we got on the same page. Once a week, we were dialed in to what we were doing. During process improvement, we always had a section in that meeting of the wins and the misses. And we talked about them. We talked about, you know, why, why is this hard over here? What's going on with this? And we would ask for input from across the whole cadre of the leadership team of the bank to share those things and get them done. But all the while, the vision of where we were going with process improvement was repeated, repeated, repeated. Nobody left there not understanding the mission. Number six, you can learn from other leaders. And this is a, a principle that's probably good for anybody that's got a management job of any kind for anything. Always look for those that have gone before you. Study what they've done. Listen to how they have overcome the problem. You heard I've done some faith-based work in my past. There's a scripture in the Bible that says there's nothing new under the sun. You think you got a problem? Go ask some questions. You will find somebody that's already been there, already done it, already figured it out, probably had some success doing it. You just got to ask. Then as you dive into the change mode, go boldly. This is not for the weak of heart. Right? And if you're going to be the leader of it, you've got to stay bold about it. And realize that mistakes are going to happen. You've got to embrace them. You've got to deal with them, be willing to do that. But fix them quickly. Stop and assess yourself from time to time. Look at your process and where it's standing. 
I can promise you from my seat in my big initiative, and I'm just, I'm, I'm highlighting this one, believe me, I've been through many, probably many more than I would like to admit, but, you know, in the heat of battle, you as the leader get battle weary. You start kind of breaking down and losing your energy and losing your spunk, and you've got to assess your own prog progress along the way, and of course correct as you need to. Make those changes, be nimble, be ready to go. Number eight, prioritize and act. There's a lot of uh, great, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of great uh, business writing that's come out in the last couple of years about execution and delivery. Anybody read uh, The Four Disciplines of Execution? You familiar with that book? Sean, Sean Covey is one of the co-authors of it. Uh, he doesn't word it this way. This is from uh, Gary Keller of the big uh, national Keller Williams realty firm. He says, find the one thing and set all your priorities around that. And you'll find that the other things are easier or perhaps even unnecessary if you can identify that with that one big thing. Um, prioritize around this one thing. Very important to consider because you're going to have a lot of information flying at you. There's a lot of things, a lot of plates spinning, a lot of things up in the air. But if you can center on the one thing that's most important, you'll overcome a lot of that. Number nine, we need to create wins. This goes back, I believe, to our people, helping them feel like this change they're going through is meaning something. There, there's an opportunity for a win here. And find those things. Never underestimate the power of the early victories when you're launching a change initiative. Go back to communicate. you got to communicate when you find one, you identify it. In our case at the bank, what we did, we kind of had a tell-all session when we uncovered something that was particularly cumbersome, particularly inefficient. We weren't so much trying to condemn or reflect on the, the unit that supported that, but we were counting it as a victory that we found one. We found this ugly, silly, old process. Maybe it was redundant, you know, maybe a step was repeated two or three times for some in any reason, but we counted that as a victory because what was our goal? Cost savings. So we tied it back to that and we claimed it as a victory and moved on. Uh, in the book, Four Disciplines of Execution, there's a term called cadence of accountability. You create a rhythm in what you're doing with this. And it's all driven on the accountability of reporting up on the project, being sure that things are coming together and of course, you got to keep pushing forward. You can't lose momentum. You have to uh, work through that. Then number 10, we're rounding, headed for home here. Equip other leaders. I think it's sad that when an organization goes through a change event that they somehow lose sight of <coughs> equipping the next level of leaders to learn from that experience and be ready to do it again at another time. But sadly, I see that happen a lot in corporate America. It's just everything's about results today, quarterly earnings. If you're a public company, we were talking about that, the public and traded companies. You're, you're focused on quarterly earnings, so your, your vision gets kind of narrow. You don't think about the opportunity to groom up the next level of leaders for the next, uh, next tranche in your company. Build momentum by doing this and create a lasting change through the continuity you'll build by showing the next generation of leaders how things can be done and sharing with them, letting them embrace that. So again, I'm, I'm gonna kind of sum up here. Change management comes in two flavors. Two forms, stroke of the pen and behavioral change. To get there, we need to lead, not manage. We need to be able to know the psychology of change, be sensitive to it, don't ignore it, don't condemn it, and use these 10 ways I've talked about to try to mitigate the resistance and the chaos, bring that whole curve up to a more level plane, Mitigate and minimize that. 
and you should have some great success. Um, this is my contact page. If you want to get a hold of me, my company name is Headway Exec. As uh, Ken said, I do executive coaching and a little bit of business consulting, not so much of that as, as I once did. Uh, mostly focused on leadership development at all, all levels. Uh, LinkedIn profiles on there, Facebook and Twitter, very active in all places. I have a blog at DougThorpe.com, real easy name to remember. And uh, I publish articles about leadership and management uh, twice weekly. And uh, you're welcome, if you would, to uh, join me there. I do have a book out. I think, Ken, you can talk about the book. I think the chapter's bought some books. And I, I don't know. Everybody gets a Christmas gift? No. Uh, there's a plan. But uh, real quick, I'm sensitive to our time slice here, but uh, questions, anybody? Yes, sir. Uh, if you do have uh, a strong resistor, somebody you suspect will be sabotaging efforts, uh, any thoughts on placate to an extent, spend some time with them, but then how to stop inadvertently rewarding them? <clears throat> yeah. Everybody hear that question? You got the resistor that you you want to? Um, oh, if I may. I'm going to object to your word placate. I mean, you got you got to try to bring them into it, but I, I would never want to let a resistor believe that they're somehow getting to me on this thing. And I think, at least to me anyway, my definition of placate kind of implies that. So, um, no, your point's a good one. And I think you, you always run the risk, if your team's big enough, you always run the risk there's, you know, Debbie or Danny Dowder that's never going to come on board, never going to buy in, and always going to produce some level of resistance. As you get closer to the official go live date of your change, if they have not come in, in my opinion and experience, it actually becomes an employment disciplinary issue, and you have to deal with it accordingly. You, you, don't, you don't need to be afraid to bring them in and say, you know what, you're, you're the last one on the team that's not getting this. And I'm worried about that, I'm concerned. Um, are you with us or are you not? I need to know today. And you know, if, if they say, and I've had this, these are words out of a real person's mouth, well, what about it? You know, what are you gonna do? And I'm going, well, you came in that door and you can go out that door for the last time, plain and simple. And sometimes, sometimes you have to do that. So if a lot of what I've tried to tell you tonight sounds a little too warm and fuzzy, believe me, there's teeth in the, in the, in the management and the leadership. There, there has to be. You, you've got to deal with that sometimes. Dr. Anderson, that was, if I can, may I think of a specific example? Yeah. Where yeah. Uh, it was a company that does a lot of printing. They call it social expression, uh, Hallmark. They have plants around, okay. primarily in Kansas. Competitive pressures were forcing them to improve their productivity. Mm -hmm. So they needed to work on setup reduction on their large presses. But they had the woman who'd been there for a long time. She was the senior. Yeah, she led the whole coup. And Gladys, well, unfortunately, some of the senior management were told initially, pay attention to the resistors. So they would sit with her at lunch. They would give her special attention when she made comments at employee meetings. And in fact, they were burning in this behavior because she was gaining power by always saying it can't happen, it can't happen, it can't happen. And then when it came time to do a workshop on setup reduction, and they're asking all the supervisors who can reduce setup time on their presses, everybody was all for it except for Gladys. And she was like, it'll never work here. And unfortunately, the facilitator at that point then just said, well, <clears throat> They can do it, they can do it, they can do it, they can do it. You can't, so you don't have to worry about it. And ignore it. And at that point, that kind of helped shift mm -hmm. But to your point, sometimes you do have to step it up with some team. Yeah, I think, I think it's an inevitable reality that in, in a large enough team, you're always going to have somebody. I, I mean, I, I explain it in you know the old bell curve analysis. I don't care who your team is, I don't care how 
how many degrees and certificates they've got, you're going to have in the same room of a large team with those credentials, you're going to have a bell curve. You're still going to have your superstars. You're going to have your laggards somewhere on that curve. And you're going to have to decide for the benefit of your own unit and the health of the company, what are you going to do with those if they're not going to finally come around? So it is a big deal and it's very much a part of the equation, I think. Okay. Um, just a short question. Uh, Um, at the sake of sounding like, let me answer the second question first. At the sake of sounding like I'm dodging it, my answer is it depends. <laughs> um, I, can, I can see modes where uh, mistakes that happen need to get admitted, but the question is, do they have to be admitted to everybody on the team? You know, is it really more of a, um, if you're a frontline or a middle manager on a big initiative and you make a mistake, Yes, it's something your boss needs to know about, and maybe even the person below you needs to know about if you're a middle manager. Uh, does the whole work team need to know about it? It depends on what impact it had on their work product or their part of the, the change at the time. Because, um, you know, trying to be a servant-hearted leader, you, you don't have to live hanging on your sword all the time. There's still an element of being confident in what you're doing, bold about what you're doing, and, and direct in what you're doing. And uh, so when a mistake happens, there's a little bit of judgment that has to be figured out to apply that step in its entirety. And after I said all that, I forgot your first question. <laughs> Oh, timing of the communication. Again, I think that depends a little bit on the scope of the project, how, how big and broad um, the effort is. Here's the interesting thing, and I, I knew I was going to be a little constrained on time here, so there's another notion that, uh, there's another curve, and I forget the name of it, but as a, as a leader of the change, you're going to have your own curve of experience sort of doing your own buy-in, your own resistance initially, and then your adoption and your execution. But your curve is going to be out here, and your people are going to be lagging behind you, if you can imagine. <laughs> um, they're going to be on that same curve, but it's going to be lagged behind. You will have been informed by senior management. You will have been to meetings. You will be doing things. And even as information starts coming out, You've maybe already bought in, but your people aren't there yet. They're still down in the chaos and resistance realm. So there's a natural <laughs> conundrum there. You're feeling gung-ho and excited about it. They're still down here. And that's where a lot of the friction happens because you're out of sync with processing the change. So the communication helps sync that up a little better and bring them up the curve a little faster to join you wherever you may be. Bill? Yeah. Comment uh, similar to uh, the first question. Uh, I'm a project leader, so I deal with change. Everything is about change. Yeah. One of the tools I've used successfully doesn't always work, but when you identify that one person or maybe more who is actively against the change, whatever it is, one of the things I've used successfully a couple times is actually then get them appointed assistant project leader. So they have skin in the game. If it fails, they're going down with it. Yeah. Doesn't always work. Sometimes yeah. you still have to go beyond that. Yeah. I've had fairly good success. That, that's a good point. And as you say that, it reminds me, I, I tell a story sometimes that, that in my banking days, unrelated to the process improvement, but just <laughs> it, it, I was dealing with a quiet rebel that was in my team perpetually always ignoring instruction and causing turmoil. Called him into my office, sat down, had that kind of, we were just on the brink of that, you know, 
you do understand the door goes both ways kind of discussion. And I had this inspiration. I, I invited them to come sit in my chair on the other side of the desk. And then I went over and plopped myself down in what would have been their chair in my office. And I said, there, there was this long, very pregnant pause. And I said, now, does this look any different to you from over there than from over here? And he said, he goes, you know, honestly, it does. And he said, and I'm not being cute. I, I get it. I get what you're saying. There are things I'm not seeing about what I need to be doing or what we're doing. And I get it. And, uh, and that one, I gladly am able to report, we kind of turned that person around and they became a pretty decent contributor on the team after that. Not perfect, but a whole lot better than they were. Quantum, quantum leaps better. Uh, there was another question in the back. Yes, ma'am. question and uh, I'm the wheels are turning I'm, I'm thinking of three or four cases exactly as you described in, in my own experience the um, I guess the quick answer is it, it gets down to knowing your people and really what I would suggest to do if this person has a repeat performance kind of issue or, or aspect about them um, I would try to dig just a little deeper and understand a little more about why they look at the world that way. Or, or, you know, the world being the job and the team they're on and everything. You know, are there some kind of drivers or there some kind of motives for doing that? I'll give you, give you a quick example and without divulging or breaking any confidence, I have had a coaching client who was a unit manager but she herself has some trust issues, just in life in general, and um, it was affecting her ability to get her team to do things, and it was, back to my bell curve, the guys that were way out on the high performance end, easy to trust, I mean, everybody <coughs> would trust them because of their demonstrated ability. Uh, they were fine, but they were almost invisible to her, and then everybody else on the team was deemed a problem and the magnitude of sin, if you will, that the person might have committed as an employee was so minuscule and yet this manager couldn't trust them because it was one of these, aha, every time in my life that's happened to me, I've you know, not been able to trust that person ever again. So it was this projection and a lot of those kind of things. and. Um, it really was kind of, in this case, it was up to the manager to kind of fix their view of the world. And really, uh, what I encouraged her to do, once we got past some of the personal views that she had, I got her to drill down a little deeper. You know, well, why do you think that person works that way? You know, what is it about what they've got going on that makes them respond that way? Do you know that? Have you had a discussion at that level and find out? And I was able to actually go so far as to use the exact example that we had uncovered of this manager's mistrust of life in general as an example of, you know, that's your behavior, that's on you. You trigger on events and words and reactions, and you, when you trigger, you spin off in a much darker hole than you need to be. Is there any chance this employee that you deem a problem, that they've got some of those kind of things going on too? And on that note, what I'll add is, my experience is this. All of us are human. 
At least last time I checked around here, I don't see any androids walking around. Um, what that means is we all show up for work at some level on the Maslow's hierarchy every day. And if, if you're not familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy in, in, uh, in psychology and in management, you, you need to look at that. What that says is, you know, the lowest level is you're just worried about surviving. I mean, you know, the bears are chasing you. You don't know if you're going to live to sundown. But then above that, there's a little bit of, there's a higher level of survivability, but now you're looking for security. And then it goes on up where you finally start getting into satisfaction and self-actualization and all those things. Well, having managed hundreds of employees over my career, I can promise you every one of them shows up at a different place on that hierarchy every day. And that's what makes being a manager so darn hard. Because even your best employee has a bad day. And that's just the reality of it. So unless you can create some touch points with your people, and if any HR types are here, I don't mean that literally, I mean <laughs> connecting, um, you're not going to be able to, to use that to your advantage to lead them better. So I think that's very important to be able to create among your team. That's also, kind of getting on the soapbox here, that's also why the theory of span of control is so real. You just can't go very far with people without losing some ability to have that knowledge and have that insight and have that connection. It's impossible. Using my bank example, our CEO made the 71 unit bank presidents report directly to him. Horrible org chart. But the guy was a dynamo and he pulled it off. So I've, I've taught that in business school before and everybody tells me I'm lying. But there's never been an organization that operated effectively that way and I'm telling you, nay, nay, I saw one, I worked for one. But that's rare. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What would you recommend to get people to buy into the change? Not just do it, but maybe not drag their feet so much. Like they're gonna do it, but maybe get them more enthusiastic about it or maybe Going along with it. Yeah, um, that's a very good question, and I guess my, my general inclination is that hopefully before your organization decided to launch this change initiative, that if you've been an influencer or even the manager of that team, that you've been able to do these other things along the way to kind of build buy-in just on a regular day-to-day -day basis. That's why I think honing leadership skills is so important for anyone that's progressing into a management role, project management or otherwise. Developing some of these bona fide leadership skills, um, John Maxwell calls it lifting your lid. We all go to work with a sort of a maximum capacity to lead. Some of us, some call it the Peter Principle. Um, but it's been proven there are ways you can grow beyond, you can raise that lid, you can build better leadership capacity individually. It, it requires a personalized custom growth plan to figure out where you need to lead to uh, grow, what areas you need to grow in. But, um, you know, I tell all new aspiring managers, you've got to start working on that on day one to build that rapport with your team because change is inevitable, it's going to come. And if you, haven't invested in building those capacities um, just to turn the switch on and say we're initiating a change, that's going to be a steep curve. I, there's no doubt about it. And if that's where you are, you, you may have to, you may have no choice but to be a little more heavy handed to get it, get some, um, <laughs> in, in flying we call it ground speed, you got to get some ground speed to get lift to take off. And uh, if your ground speed's too slow, you're, you're never going to take off. You're just going to run out of runway and in the ditch or over the freeway. So, okay. That's right. Not really a question. Actually, just to tag on to your answers for her. Basically, you, one way to do it is the typical what's in it for me. This is chain management project coming up. <coughs> Bring entire enterprise. Let them know this is a new change, a new RFP system coming. 
here is, here is a, a livestock person who is scared of learning a new system. And if he or she doesn't learn, he or she is afraid that it might be fired. So you let the person know that learn this, your job, the job satisfaction improves with the number of, you know, with the number of measurable, you know, answers for the person. Just basically what's in it for me. When the person knows that he or she's gonna benefit from a change, most times they come along. So if you don't mind being a facility, I'll add on to that. But looking for the, the what's in it for me and the measurable, uh, sometimes make sure there's not something that's sabotaging your overall effort. Uh, I did a turnaround work with a automotive components manufacturer, and they used to have a performance measurement system that each department, whether you're grind, paint, weld, what have you, each department was measured on efficiency. The faster you got it done, regardless of the quality, the higher your bonus. <laughs> so the game became bury your neighbor. If you could pile up more stuff in front of the next operation, and, it, and if your quality was bad, not only was that not so much of a, that's their problem, it slowed them down, so their efficiency went down, your bonus went up. So, dialing into that what's in it for me, one of the things was, I had to ask top management, can you please change your efficiency bonus reward structure? <laughs> I, I know the airlines are, are, you know, PR fodder these days, but there was once upon a time when Gordon Bethune took over Continental Airlines, their ratings were horrible, their planes were late and all that. He dug in and the first executive change he made was their ratings and efficiency was based on fuel economy. And so pilots got their bonuses based on how much fuel they saved on flights. Well, how do you save fuel on an airplane? You go slow, and which means you're going to be late. And when you're late, you're going to be late for the next one. You're going to take off later and it blah, 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 you know, it compounds. So Beth Yoon's first change was, kill that. Our bonus is on time performance, period. I don't care how much fuel you got to burn to get there. So that's why if, if you were a traveler back in the Gordon Beth Yoon Continental days, there was a sudden shift you could recognize and you would feel the planes. <laughs> I mean, if, if they were getting ready to, you know, headwind or whatever, if they were getting ready to miss an arrival timeline, man, they pumped it. And, you know, so it, it made a huge change and their ratings, consumer ratings went up in just, you know, weeks, not not years. So, but that's a long time ago. Gordon, where are you? <laughs> um, anyway, okay, other questions? Yeah. All right, well, it's been a pleasure, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh,